Hello, dear students. Now comes a very important question, and let's discuss that, and that is about tuning forks. Now, tuning fork is one thing which will be given to your practicals again and again, and the examiner will ask you to perform these particular tuning fork tests. So, I'm going to quickly demonstrate a very important test to you and tell you the interpretation that is Weber's test. Now, what is Weber's test? Weber's test is a test for testing bone conduction. It is done with the help of a 512 hertz tuning fork. So always remember, whenever you are doing Weber's test, you have to use 512 hertz tuning fork. Now the second question that follows is, why and how 512 tuning fork is the best among all? So 512 hertz tuning fork is the closest, this particular frequency is closest to our speech frequency. That is the first point. This particular tuning fork does not produce overtones. That is me, excessive tones are not produced. That are called as overtones. The third point is that 512 hertz tuning fork have got adequate tone decay time. That means the time the tone takes to decay. It's called as tone decay time. This is particularly adequate as far as 512 is concerned. That is why we use 512 hertz tuning fork in Weber's test. Now, he's my patient. Hi. Hi. And I'm going to demonstrate a particular test on you for our students so that they can know about Weber's test. So can I do a test on you? Yes. So I have taken a formal consent with the patient and this has to be done by everyone who is doing examination in your practical exams. You have to sit the comfortably, comfortably the, uh, the last part. You have to seat the patient comfortably. It should be a well lighted room and you have to take a consent of the patient explain the procedure in the language the patient understands. So I have explained him the procedure and now I'm going to demonstrate how the Weber's test is done. So as I told you, Weber's test is done by 512 hertz tuning fork and it is a test of bone conduction only. Now, how do you strike the tuning fork? Remember, tuning fork has got different parts. The upper part of the tuning fork is called as a prong. Now this is also called as tines. The area where these prongs are joining in the center, this is called as the base. Where I'm holding the tuning fork here, this is called as a stem. And finally, the lowermost portion, which is flat, this is called as a foot plate. So I have to only hold this particular instrument with my two fingers here. And I cannot hold it very much up or down. Why? Because the frequency, once it generates, the hand is going to dampen them. Okay, so hold it with two fingers. Okay, and now you have to strike the tuning fork at the junction of the upper two third and lower one third so that this tuning fork starts vibrating. Now, once the tuning fork starts to vibrate, it will release a sound wave, and this is the direction where the sound wave will travel. That is why this is called as an acoustic axis. So, your wave will travel parallel to the acoustic axis. Okay, my hand is like this. This is the acoustic axis, which is parallel to the tuning fork prongs. Okay, so now how to strike it is the next question. Whenever I strike a tuning fork, it should not be struck over the head of the patient, which many people do. They will tongue. This is not supposed to be done. It has to be struck over certain prominences. It should not be struck over the table. The second question is why? It's because if you put it over on a hard surface, it will catch certain frequencies which are beyond our hearing. That is called as overtones. So you don't want that. Okay. So good area where you can strike it is either take a rubber stamp, right? Where you can strike it over that rubber pad. Or if you don't have it, you can use the hypothenar eminence of the palm or the olecranon process, right? Or even the front part of the knee. In any of these, you can strike it and then you have to put this particular foot plate over the vertex. Now, this is a particular hairy portion, right? So, in general, in Weber's test, we don't put it over the vertex. It's because if the patient is too hairy, it will dampen the sound. So, we will keep it over on the mid part of the forehead. If not the forehead, then you can keep in any bony prominence in the center. So, where all? You can keep it over on the nasal bridge or you can keep it over the upper incisor, or you can even keep it over the mentum or the chin. These are the bony prominences in the center, which will elicit the Weber's test as it is. Okay, 
but we will choose the forehead in this particular gentleman. Now, now what I'll do is I'll hold the tuning fork from the stem and I'll strike it over the hypothena remnants. So I strike it, I keep it. Aapko sound under sunai diya? Yes. So he will hear a zing type of sound that is created inside due to bone conduction. Aapko kis taraf zada sunai diya? Ya dono mein barabar sunai diya? Dono mein barabar. So he heard the sound which was produced by bone conduction. Mm -hmm. That means vibrations went through his skull and they stimulated both the cochlea together. That means the Weber's in this particular patient is normal or we will say it is centralized. Centralized means it has gone equally to both the ears. So this gentleman has got normal hearing. Okay. Now I'm going to interpret you the results of Weber's test. Okay. So we have done and we know how to do the Weber's test. But the question that will come to you will be that they will give you a scenario and they will try to give you an interpretation as to what has happened to this patient. So just let me draw a rough figure as to what happens in Weber's test. Let's say, this is the man I'm talking about, okay? Let's say this is the man and we did the Weber's test on this man. There are two ears on both the sides, okay? And inside, you know that there is inner ear. This is the inner ear of the right side. And this is the inner ear of the left side. Okay, there's the right side, there's the left side. And what we did was that we kept a tuning fork over the forehead. We struck it. And then we asked the patient where did they feel the vibration. So obviously when they strike it and, and we keep it, what will happen? The bone vibrations will reach bilateral cochlea because of the transcranial vibration. Okay, so bilaterally, the cochlea will get stimulated. So if there is bilateral stimulation of cochlea equally, then the patient will perceive sound equally and we will say that the patient has got normal Weber's test or in simple words, we can just say that the Weber's test is centralized. So in normal people, Weber's test will be centralized. That is the first thing or the first interpretation. Mm. Now let's come to the second interpretation. That is if suppose this gentleman had sensory neural hearing loss or conductive mm. hearing loss, then Weber's will be lateralized to which side? Now it's a very, very simple concept. Yet it amazes me that so many people get it wrong when it comes to exams. Now think, let's say this particular person had got some kind of a problem in the cochlea or let's say the vestibular cochlear nerve because the nerve is coming out of the cochlea going into the brain. So let's say this particular person has got sensory neural hearing loss on the right side. Sensory neural means if there's any pathology in the vestibular cochlear nerve, so neural sensory means that it has got something wrong in the hair cells of the cochlea. So sensory neural hearing loss has happened or the inner ear is not functioning on the right side. But the left side cochlea is okay. Now you only tell me. If I keep a tuning fork here, which side will get the vibrations better? Obviously, the side which is having a functioning cochlea, right? That will be better. So in obvious cases, if the patient has got sensory neural hearing loss, the Weber's will get lateralized to the better ear. So in this case, if the right side is diseased, the left side will have better hearing. So I'll say in sensory neural hearing loss, the Weber's is lateralized to better ear. In, in case of this, it will be lateralized to the better side, that is the left side, because the right side is diseased. Makes sense? It's very, very easy, right? But what will be the scenario when there is conductive hearing loss? Now let's come that this particular patient has conductive hearing loss. Now this is something which is the difficult part to understand or people get confused. Now let's say, this particular gentleman didn't have any disease of the cochlea. His cochlea was absolutely normal. Okay. Let me just erase out the disease from here. And let's make this particular cochlea to be normal. So let's say this particular cochlea is absolutely normal. But now this particular gentleman has a disease 
in the middle ear. Okay? So this particular disease is now there in the middle ear. This is a disease in the middle ear compartment. So now if there is a disease in the middle ear compartment on the right side and the left side has got a normal external middle and inner ear, the Weber's will lateralize to which side is the question. So now you know that any sound that is coming inside the ear has to travel from the external ear, then the middle ear, then into the inner ear. So sound has to travel in this direction. In this case, his conductive pathway is blocked. That means he, his sound cannot enter beyond the middle ear very well into the inner ear. It's very less. So he has got a block in the conductive pathway. Now when we perform Weber's test, in conductive hearing loss, Weber's will get lateralized to the disease side. It will get lateralized to diseased ear, not in the better ear. Now you will ask me why? Why has the Weber's gone to the disease side if this side has got a disease and this side is okay? Why it has gone? Now you are telling ulta of sensory neural. So it's because of the fact, simply think, close your one ear. Okay, I said just close and try talking to yourself. Now when you talk, which side do we hear more? Obviously the ear that you have blocked, you will hear more sound inside. Now that is what is called as the theory of masking. So this is called as theory of masking. Now what is called theory of masking? Masking means that if we cut out the ambient noise from the outside, which is coming inside the ear, the sound which is conducted through the bone vibration gets amplified. Simple. So if we cut off this sound because of the disease that has happened into the middle ear, the sound that is reaching the cochlea through this tuning fork will become much more amplified in the cochlea. It will increase. Why? Because this area is just like it has blocked. So the sound is not entering inside. So this amplification of the bone vibration becomes much more because the conductive pathway is blocked or it is masked. Okay, this is called as a theory of masking. So they will ask you what are the reasons for Weber's test to lateralize in conductive hearing loss towards the disease side and why it is in sensory neural hearing loss that it goes to the better side. So these are the particular reasons that you should know and this is how a particular Weber's test is performed.